What you're seeing on screen is all one single compute shader that took me approximately 100 days to make. And it's part of my goal to make an entire real-time rendered galaxy. But the insane journey to get to this point actually started a full year ago. So, to understand how I got here, let's go back to that point in time. The story actually starts roughly 15 months ago, when I was five months into working on my current and first commercial game, Scrapanauts. Scrapanauts has to be its own video, but all you need to know for now is that around the five month mark, this was the time I got really interested in shaders, thanks to a YouTuber called Rigic the Chromatos. Seeing that their game was made in Game Maker and looked so stunning, it immediately snapped me into the realization that the engine I'm using isn't the problem, I'm the problem. And from there, my hunger for shaders grew. I started by making terrible water shaders that looked more like poison swamps. But as time went on, my understanding of shaders grew and I started to make decent looking shaders, like this grass shader proper water shader, and even an engine effect shader. You should go wish the scrap knots, by the way. But anyway, there was still one issue. I couldn't satiate all my hunger for shaders in an entirely 2D game. Stuff like ray marching and ray tracing, which I was dying to dip my toes into. And exactly one year ago, this is how the story began. So, really quick intro to ray marching for those who don't know what it is. I'm not going to go too deep into it because there's so many great videos that already do that, but hopefully this should give those who don't know what ray marching is enough info to keep up with the video. Ray marching is an alternate form of rendering, primarily used to render volumes such as cloud. And speaking of, the first type of ray marching I'll show you is fixed step ray marching. But in this example, I'll be showing you what it looks like to render a solid circle. Now, this is a side-on view. This is the camera origin. You can think of this like your eye or your player's eye, and it's often referred to as the ray origin. For each pixel on the screen, a ray will be shot out from the ray origin in said direction. Now you'll see why this is called fixed step ray marching. Each ray takes a fixed step size forward and then it checks for collisions. It repeats this until it hits something. But as you can see, the collision detection isn't accurate to the surface of a circle. This is why fixed step ray marching is often used to render volumes and not solid objects. So here's what that code looks like. So if you follow the Godot advanced post-processing page, we're basically starting from that point. So the collision inaccuracies in fixed step ray marching manifest as banding artifacts. And in the case of volumes, instead of checking for collisions, the ray accumulates density and calculates lighting. Sebastian has an amazing video explaining how this works for those who are interested. For solid objects, there's another type of ray marching much faster, sine distance field ray marching. This type of ray marching uses the signed distance field of an object to make each ray travel the maximum safe distance it can without hitting said object. And it does this every step. As you can see here, it dramatically reduces the amount of steps taken. The caveat is that you must be able to represent the object you're colliding with as a signed distance field. And it's also not as efficient at grazing angles. But you can also see here as the rays closest to the circle take many, many more steps and sometimes don't even collide. Regardless, I've added a link to the description where you can learn more about sine distance field ray marching with a bunch of great examples. Anyway, I'll return to the technicalities in a bit. For now, let's get back to my first adventure in ray marching. Now, because I did this in Game Maker, it caused a bit of a headache. This is because Game Maker doesn't actually support SBOs, 3D textures, or compute shaders. But because of that, I had to figure out how to encode a 3D texture into a 2D texture. And in the process, I ended up learning a lot. So that was my first experience with ray marching. And at the end of the two weeks, 
I'll be honest, I felt a bit underwhelmed because I couldn't use this in Scrabonauts. So instead of returning to Scrabonauts like a responsible person, I of course started another side project. And of course, I used Game Maker again because I was the most comfortable with it, but in hindsight, I should have just bit the bullet and switched to Ghidorah. It would have saved me at least 50 hours of trouble, but regardless, I started making a 3D quadri mesh based planet. The plan was to ray march the atmosphere and clouds, but keep the planet mesh based. But as you can see, I didn't really get the proportions right, and it looks more like a cartoon interpretation of a planet. I also didn't really understand shaders all that intuitively yet, so I ended up separating all my shaders. So it ended up being one pass for the atmosphere, one pass for the clouds, one pass for the planet, which led to a lot of unnecessary reads and writes. I also got some unplanned experience with DDA ray marching in this project. And that was because I wanted to try and make a voxel spaceship, but it turns out refreshing a 3D model multiple times per second in Game Maker is very slow. Just by switching from a CP side mesh reconstruction to a voxel DDA Raymarch setup, it allowed for the voxels to be updated thousands of times faster. And of course, this system allowed me to make use of the prior knowledge I gained to write the 3D voxel data to a 2D texture. It still wasn't anything too fancy, no acceleration structures, just a 3D array encoded to a 2D texture. This was still a very important experience though. Also, as you can see in the background, I tried some different planet generation settings and cloud settings to try and make it look a little less cartoon-like. It was a little bit better, but I still wasn't satisfied. So considering that I still wasn't happy with my clouds or planet, and having gotten sick of Game Maker and how slow it felt to get anything 3D done, I decided to switch to Gooder. Here I tried an entirely new form of cloud ray marching using a 2D weather texture to extrapolate broader cloud shapes and using smaller 3D textures to adjust the cloud's fine grain look. I tried this based on a paper I found and I'll also leave that in the description. It's a great resource for this particular concept as using a 2D weather texture allows for more precise artistic control over where your ray march clouds are and how they look. I also had to, for the first time, use white noise to offset the rays and stop this banding effect, commonly seen with ray marching. I actually did notice this in Game Maker as well, but thanks to the flat color pixel art style, it wasn't that noticeable. I also experimented with trying to stylize said clouds, but I wasn't too happy with the white noise effect on the clouds. It made them look more spray painted than real. Now, I still felt like things could be improved, but since I felt kind of burnt out on the clouds, I decided to put that aside and just get started with the project. At first, I started experimenting with the looks, starting with the shaders for the grass, trying out different stylized looks just to see what works and what doesn't. I also tried to model some rocks and see what looked decent with some shaders. Then I got started with the trees. I initially tried to use Blender's tree gen plugin, but it created a tree with 600,000 vertices. That's basically gonna take half of my frame time budget to render. And especially if I was gonna make a pretty shader for it, I had to scrap that and attempt to make my own. A day later, I did model my own tree and it didn't go so well. Something about them just looked off before I even set up the shaders, but considering that it took me a full day to make, it left me feeling defeated from wanting to make the tree model again. So I spent the night researching some trees and stylized games like Genshin and Zelda and got some rest. The next day I decided I didn't want to model my own trees, but luckily there was a tool I discovered during my research prior, Tree It. Within 30 minutes, I had a tree that was just a mere 3000 vertices even lower than my handmade tree, and I got started making a custom shader for it. After a few iterations, I got something I was happy with, and after a few more tweaks, I made this. This tree was perfect, pretty much exactly what I wanted, but I couldn't place down tens of thousands of this tree, so I ended up making the perfect imposter tree with lighting built in. From a distance, you can't even tell the difference between the imposter tree and the full detail tree, despite the imposter tree only being two intersecting quads. At this point, I was ready, was confident, and I believed I could start with the planet. So really quickly before we start the next chapter, I wanted to let you know that this video took forever to make, and that's obviously not even considering the thousands of hours I put to get to this point. 
There was actually a lot that I didn't get to cover in this video for lens sake. I ended up putting all that into a separate video where I also go through my trial and error process. It's a little bit of a peek into my mind and my workflow. If you're interested in that, you can watch that on coffee for the price of a coffee. Your support would be highly appreciated. Anyway, back to the video. So originally my intention was not to make a very much planet. A traditional mesh-based planet has huge benefits and neat tricks like scaling LOD that make it perfect for these types of games. That's why quadtree or octree mesh-based planets are used almost exclusively everywhere. No Man's Sky uses a voxel-based octree planet. Kerbal Space Program uses a quadtree-based planet. Space Engineers, which I believe also uses an octree voxel planet. So considering all that, and the fact that I've already made a mini quadtree planet, how hard could it be just to do that again, right? Wrong. You see, I never had to make a full-scale planet. More importantly, I never had to place anything on that planet's surface before, and I quickly learned that things wouldn't be as easy as I had hoped. So, considering I'm generating my planet's surface through noise, I can quickly calculate where the floor is just by reading from said noise. That's what I had hoped to use to place the trees in a performance way. But what I had failed to account for was that a planet made from vertices can only sample the height at its vertices. This results in a resolution mismatch. Now, there was two solutions to this issue. One, I can increase the resolution of the planet until floating wasn't visible. Two, I can raycast the trees onto the surface of the planet. The issue with the first solution is that memory consumption would become ridiculous with the current quadtree system I was using. To put simply, I was generating the planet once and then caching all that mesh data, even if the mesh wasn't in use. I did it this way because it's by far the most performant solution at the cost of memory. So to scale up mesh resolution where it matters, while also keeping memory footprint acceptable, I would have to scrap the caching system and generate the planet's surface on the fly while discarding unused quadtree chunks. This basically involves multi-threading and or combi shaders. So instead of redoing the entire planet and ending up with a result that I'm not even sure I would be happy with, I decided I'd just use ray marching. Ray marching, as we've discussed and seen, by this point I already had a lot of experience with, and there's so many benefits to this. One, there's no mesh you need to store, so the memory footprint is extremely low. Two, there's no pop-in. Since ray march resolution is per pixel, not per vertice, no matter how far or close you are to the planet, the detail is perfectly crisp. Three, it shows any changes you make to it in real time. This means that you can iterate very quickly on what planets look good and don't. So, before we start with the planet ray marching, let's revisit the technicalities. Remember I mentioned ray tracing? Ray tracing is often used to accelerate ray marching. You might have heard algorithms such as a ray box intersection or a ray sphere intersection, and they're used to encapsulate whatever is being ray marched. These functions output the distance to the object and the distance through the object, the object in this case being the bounding box. And using these, we can know exactly where to ray march and if we need to ray march at all. For a box, this is what that looks like, and hopefully it's self-explanatory. Any pixel that is completely blacked out means that there's no ray marching to be done there. And obviously, the rest of the pixels you see show the distance through the box. So why is this important? Well, because we use the ray sphere intersection algorithm to speed up ray marching for the planet, because fixed step ray marching is very inefficient without it. And while I told you that you shouldn't be using this for collisions, as you can see, in this case, the collisions are actually pretty accurate and we're not actually going through that many race steps. And this is essentially how the planet is being ray marched. I quickly plugged in the same planet texture that I created for the planet mesh generation into a very simple ray march data. And within a few hours, I had this. And yeah, I underestimated how much step precision I would need for Raymarch terrain. And considering that I couldn't cheat with white noise offsetting like when I Raymarch the clouds, I would need to find a solution later. But for now, I just cranked the raised step count up and raised step size down and fixed the issue. 
a few more days of experimenting and I also managed to optimize the ray marching. Now, not only is the frame time much better up close, but it's also 10 times faster from far away, meaning I could have many, many planets on the screen at once and still be completely fine. So with that done now, I started porting all my shader code from Godot to a pure GLSL compute shader so that I can make my own custom rendering pipeline using Godot's built-in fancy new compositor effect system. After porting, I finally worked on the atmosphere and some basic lighting to make the planet feel a little less bold. This was such a pain. It's so easy to mess up the mats and end up with a weirdly thin feeling atmosphere with improper scattering. And that's if you even get it to work in the first place. So after a week straight of nearly pulling my hair out, I managed to finally pull it off. And personally, I'm very happy with the result. So glad I didn't give up on the atmosphere or compromise by going with the first result. I quickly also spent some time revamping and improving the planet procedural texturing and fixed the ocean depth bug that had been bothering me for some time. And that's it, a full scale Raymarch planet, which has now taken the crown for the most complex shader I've ever wrote to date. Well, it's only gotten more complex since my additions to the shader to get the galaxy working, but that will be for the next video. And that's part one of this project might have noticed that I never got to place down the grass or the trees. That will be for the next part along with hopefully clouds and the finished galaxy. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that and please do like the video if you enjoyed. Since this channel is new, any and all algorithm engagement would help a lot. If you made it this far, leave a comment letting me know what you'd like from my coffee page. See you next time.